All right. This is the challenge of emotional labor in open source communities. Um, I'm Ken Rickard. I'm now, we just did a little reorg. I'm now the senior director of consulting at Palantir.net. Um, so just heard talking to Jenna. We do projects like for the univer uh, university, for the state of Georgia. We just implemented a uh, search across all 90 of your properties in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Track of it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, I'm Agent Rickard online. I've been doing Drupal 2005. Um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I used to do a lot more development work than I do now. Um, you can find me in maintainers.txt in Drupal 7, uh, but not in Drupal 8, and you won't in Drupal 9. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this talk and the agenda. Uh, the big agenda is why does emotional labor matter to Drupal? So what are we going to talk about? We're going to define the concept of emotional labor, we're going to examine the sort of common usage and criticisms of that usage, just so people are aware. We're going to explore the value of emotional labor in our work and discuss challenges. Um, does everyone actually, does anyone, let me ask you this question. How many people in here are familiar with the concept of emotional labor? Have you even heard the, 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 the top of it? Okay, so people do that. Story. I also should grab, like, why did I write this? Um, it's interesting. I said I used to do a lot more development, uh, and now I'm the senior director. I spent two years actually running sales and marketing also. And I found doing sales absolutely exhausting. Um, and as part of my sort of recovery from that, I tried to figure out why. And I started diving into this concept of emotional labor. It really resonated. And then once you start doing, once I started doing research on it, I started seeing some things that very tightly overlap with a lot of things going on in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, and since I've been around since 2005, and I'm a big, tall, old white dude, uh, there's some stuff we're going to talk about here that I think I can get away with um, without getting challenged on. Um, and I can also do it without very much personal risk. Whereas if someone from a more marginalized community came up and had this conversation, um, it'll be a lot more uh, difficult, I think, for them. Uh, and we will get into that, I think, today. So we do have content warning. Yay, content warning. Um, we're going to condense some very complicated issues. Uh, I apologize. We're going to discuss our work in the context of gender roles, racial and ethnic identity, and other sensitive topics. I try real hard to be respectful of these things. I will make mistakes. I'm happy to hear um, constructive feedback when we're done. Uh, uh, I use a lot of uh, Creative Commons photography to illustrate some points. Uh, the use of individual images are in no way an endorsement of the things that I'm saying. So, <clears throat> what is emotional labor? This is sort of the meat of things. Um, Hey, proper attribution of female academics. Woohoo! Um, Dr. Harley Russell Hostile from the Manage Park in 1983, which is a really fascinating book that I will admit I have not read the entire thing of. But um, she defines this term. Emotional labor is a process by which workers are expected to manage their feelings in accordance with organizationally defined rules and guidelines. Think of your Walmart greeter whose job is to put on a smile and say hello to everyone who walks in. That is an actual example of emotional labor. That's a weird one because that's like their job is to greet people. But imagine, we've actually just instituted this at my company. We're supposed to start every meeting by welcoming everyone to the meeting. And I find this a little strange. But emotional labor is the process by which you're expected to manage feelings in accordance with standards. Okay. Um, so this is a simplification here. Emotional labor is simply the management of feelings, your own or someone else's, that's important, I think, uh, to accomplish some goal. Um, so here's a great analogy. Again, attribute the academics correctly. Uh, it's kind of like when you get a gift and you don't really like it, but you smile anyway and say, oh, gee, thanks, Aunt Harriet. That's the greatest pair of socks I've ever been given. Right? Um, it's important. It smooths relationships. Right? It makes people feel comfortable and confident in interacting with you. Um, I do love this picture of Greece where he's actually doing a ribbon cutting, but he looks like he's like, why did I get this as a gift? Um, so uh, when you're doing it like, with your aunt, it's not a big deal. But when you have to do it all day long as part of your job, um, tied to wages and outcomes, and if you don't do it, there are consequences, and typically with strangers, I should know. I gave a version of this talk, I should turn off the thing. I gave a version of this talk um, at DrupalCon Seattle where your boss was sitting in the audience and one of his contractors was sitting next to him and had to moderate 
his reactions to the talk is he didn't want to give your boss any indication that I had hit some hot buttons. <laughs> that, is a, that was a fascinating moment. <clears throat> so we're talking about moderating um, your social behavior, right? So that in itself I don't think is that um, controversial. Um, and I should also point out, this is one of the comments or criticism, the feeling of frustration felt over a task doesn't make it emotional labor. Right? Just because you're like, ah, this code won't compile, we had this problem the other day, it's like, yarn is not working correctly. And I had to go do a bunch of debugging, and it was really annoying, it's not emotional labor. Um, let's talk about the difference between, again, things that are social jobs, that are not emotional labor. So some things that we do, event planning, coordination, formal mentoring, volunteer coordination, project management, product management, involve a lot of human interaction. Those by themselves are not emotional labor. There's emotional labor associated with them. Right, but I want to be clear that there's two separate con concepts here. I will also point out, uh, and we'll get to this a little more, but <clears throat> emotional labor is generally when you are compelled to behave in a way that you normally would not, right? So these activities tend to attract people who like this kind of work, so they don't think of it as painful work, right? Have you ever met a really good salesperson, for example? Really good salespersons do not suffer from the kind of burnout that I suffered from. Why? Because they love to do sales. Because they love to meet new people, and they like the adrenaline of closing and all that stuff. Right? So it's not emotional labor to them, because it doesn't force them to change their natural behavior. Right? So some of these jobs, um, again, will involve emotional labor. Like I don't do some of the mentoring and volunteer coordination that other people do, because I find it exhausting. I just can't. Right? I mean, I could, but self-care is important. So a couple of criticisms. Um, is everything emotional labor? Um, definitions of emotional labor you know, do capture a lot of things. Organizing secret set events, taking notes during a meeting, maintaining a smile, this smiling disposition at all times. Um, and sometimes people will use this sort of loose definition to dismiss the very concept of emotional labor. Um, I will argue that that dismissiveness is um, disingenuous. <laughs> right? Uh, so again, uh, this is a nice, this is a, this is a good article. Uh, but uh, the terms of expansion is convenient out for some critics. It's like, oh, you're just saying that because you're frustrated. I don't think that's the case. It's an actual thing. Um, the two really interesting related concepts here that we talk about, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, are display rules and surface acting. Display rules, the attempt to uh, manage the display of one's emotion to conform to cultural norms. Right. Hey, it's a party, I should be happy. Right. Uh, we're posing for a photo, I should be smiling. Right. Uh, we're posing for a group photo, I should be comfortable being close to other people. Right. Um, and surface acting, which is when someone changes their verbal, facial, and bodily expression uh, without modifying their underlying feelings. Does this resonate for anyone? Yeah. And again, we'll, we'll dive into these in a second. So um, surface acting, and, and this is fascinating. This is where I started to really get deep into the topic. Um, research shows that the tendency to engage in surface acting, in which there's a high level of incongruity between what people feel and what they show, comes with real cost to the person in the organization. And it's fascinating because I've was i always expected a lot of pushback on this talk. So we'll get into some academic studies of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> When people habitually evoke the stress of surface acting, they're more likely to be prone to depression and anxiety, increased job performance, and burnout. All right, says our researcher from the Harvard Medical School. Uh, <laughs> surface acting has some common causes to it. Um, uh, mismatch between your personality uh, and what's expected from you in your role. This is why I do not make a good event planner, why I do not do well in sales, right? I can sell things, but I don't do lead generation very well. I don't do lead cultivation very well, but I can close now because I've practiced a lot. Uh, misalignment of values when you're being asked to do something that doesn't accord with what you believe in. 
right? Workplace culture in which uh, particular ways of expressing emotion, uh, is display rules, are endorsed or not. We will get to that sort of in part three of this talk. Um, and so the, the piece I want to, this sort of ends the definition portion of what the heck is emotional labor. And the big point I want to get across is that by definition, no one enjoys performing emotional labor. Right? It is something that you feel compelled to do, and you do because of that compulsion. Okay? Are there questions at this point? Is there controversy at this point? This is, this is basically grin and bear, right? Um, yeah, a little bit, yeah. This is to quote off the space, you don't have enough flair. <laughs> right? You need more flair. Come back, you know, when you have 20 pieces of flair. Right? Look at Justin. Justin has, right? <clears throat> Well, I, I have to admit I was misunderstanding the phrase emotional labor okay. there. Not all frustration, but thinking of it in terms of frustration dealing with people specifically. Right. And it's, again, particularly when you try to manage either your emotions or other people's emotions. And it's, it's interesting to me, too, because um, I have managed a lot of people for a while. I also I have an anger management issue that most of you don't know about because I do very well at um, managing it now because I've done a lot of training on it, right? And so I do some emotional labor that's about <clears throat> managing my own emotional state and helping other people recognize and manage their own sometimes. Um, but I really do not like it. Uh, I had to do a mediation between two colleagues the other day. And it was just like, this is important. I will do it. And I, it, it ruined my whole day. <clears throat> um, so why does emotional labor matter? Um, and I, and I, I, I like this stuff. Um, and the software development is traditionally stereotyped as this lone wolf job. You know, that, that I was reading something on Twitter yesterday about the 10x developer. Right? And the real 10x developer, this person was saying, is the person who makes everyone around them better. Right? Uh, they're not some person off in a closet somewhere. But this is the stereotype. Um, it is worth noting, um, by the way, a lot of early studies on emotional labor ignored software as an industry because of that stereotype. They were just like, oh, it doesn't apply to this group of people. <clears throat> that has changed. Um, there are no locals anymore. Uh, open source projects are now actually uh, critical pieces of infrastructure. Right? The stuff that we do touches a lot of people. Again, Jenna and I have been working on stuff for the state of Georgia. I live in Georgia, by the way. There's nine and a half million people in the state of Georgia. Give me another, to not put you on the spot. We just finished a project for the state of Wisconsin uh, uh, employee uh, trust funds, which is the pension plan for every state employee. It touches one out of every three people in the entire state. Right? Yeah, and they rely on Drupal. Right. So it's fairly critical. Um, the, yeah, this increased dependency means that there's a responsibility to ensure that the projects have the support that they need. And the support is not just financial, it's not just time. There's a couple of other things that I think we're getting really good at starting to recognize. Uh, there's a nice talk that I've seen this, this afternoon after lunch uh, about mental health. Um, it's a really raw and honest conversation, uh, but it's important. So the, the reason I argue that emotional labor matters when we talk about people who contribute, I mean, there's a couple of things. You have to attract people to the project. Um, you have to give them ways to include themselves in the project. You have to give them some satisfaction in their contribution to something. Right? And if all three of these things are met, hey, that's right, you retain people. Right? But there are things that we do deliberately and accidentally that break this down. And emotional labor is one of those things. This is my, my sort of argument. Um, <clears throat> negativity is contagious. This is from XJM, who's one of our core maintainers. Uh, even if you have good intentions and the person you talk to has good intentions, uh, dispar the disparaging remarks quickly take your discussion off track. Uh, the happiest I've ever seen, Jess, is when we were in a, in a group meeting at a DrupalCon one time, and I volunteered to project manage the meeting and take notes so that she didn't have to, because she wanted to participate at a different level. All right? We'll, we'll talk about that uh, here in a second, too. <clears throat> so. This is where things really get fun for me. Studies show that for the IT professional, emotional dissonance, that's this sort of surface acting or display rules, um, predicts work exhaustion better than traditional predictors such as perceived workload. Uh, 
our analysis also suggests, this is from a different study, by the way. So I did this first at Drupal Europe, and I was expecting a lot of pushback, so I had all these European academics with these reports. Um, discontinuation of the use of overall burnout measures because they are highly consistent with the emotional exhaustion dimension of burnout only. Okay, so the burnout caused by emotional labor, I'm gonna argue, is the number one cause of burnout. And you can probably think of cases where high profile people have left the Drupal community because they're just exhausted. Right? This is why when I took over sales, I told my bosses, I can probably do this for 18 months. Right? And they've worked very hard over the last year to disengage me from the entire sales process. Right? I actually don't know what's going on in most of our sales now. And that's the way I prefer it. Right. So <clears throat> we'll talk about Drupal specifically because I'm going to start shifting. We have a code of conduct. It's fascinating, right? We're considerate, considerate we're welcoming, we're respectful, we're collaborative. Um, these all do require some element of emotional labor, right? If I didn't get enough sleep last night, I'm in a bad mood, I still have to be welcoming and, you know, say, hey, welcome to my talk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's not a huge lift for me, right? Um, the, the key here is this bottom piece. Uh, if I don't perform little pieces of emotional labor, everyone and I, everyone I interact with has to do so on my behalf, mm. right? Uh, so if I'm not doing a little bit, everybody else has to do a little bit. This is sort of the argument. Um, and I would say think about it when new people come into an ex established community or if someone new comes to your meetup group, for instance, right? Do you have an official greeter? Do you have an official welcome? Right. Uh, one of my arguments is uh, all groups like that should have a yellow hat, and the yellow hat passes around from week to week. And if you're wearing the yellow hat that week, it's your job to greet the new people. Right? And everyone knows, hey, if you're new, look for the person in the yellow hat. Right. Uh, but it's this, this absence demands it from others is where things get. Um, fascinating, because forcing people to perform emotional effort is a common form of trolling. Does that make sense, or do I need to unpack that? Can you unpack it? I, I can unpack it a little bit. Um, uh, asking, someone goes on Twitter for an example and says, I really like Star Wars, and they're asked, because they present as a woman, they are asked immediately, oh great, um, tell me what your favorite scene in The Last Jedi. Um, this prove you belong stuff, uh, this, the whole gatekeeping mentality, right, is generally what I mean. Um, and it turns out that if you can perform people to, force people to sort of <clears throat> have to conform to these standards in ways that are uncomfortable, it's really, really effective. So that, that's really what I'm getting at. So does that help? You don't see this a lot in person. It's hard to detect. It does happen, right? Uh, particularly in the case of like, well, <laughs> another one, common one. Uh, I would say it's also commonly referred to as microaggression, right? Uh, the classic being, uh, oh, you're working at a booth. You're a woman. You must be in marketing, right? Or you must be someone's wife or girlfriend. Right? You're not here as a developer, clearly. No. Um, and so you're forcing someone to engage from a power imbalance in some respect. Um, and sort of, it's, a, it's that whole justify your existence thing. And that's a massive sort of What do I want to try to A massive expense of emotional effort, right? Because number one, you probably don't want to just start screaming at them in the middle of the exhibit hall, right? So the first thing you have to do is like go, wow, that really pissed me off. I'm going to try to not express the fact that that really pissed me off, right? And that in itself is emotional play. So, uh, and the thing is, people talk about spoon theory. You know about spoon theory? I've only got so many spoons of energy that I can go out during the day. And if we grind away those spoons with these little little things, 
you know, the fourth time it happens, you just, you. Um, <clears throat> so now again, we're getting into some sensitive areas. Who performs emotional labor? Um, surprise, uh, there's some really interesting stuff that I left out of here that talks about emotional labor in regards to homekeeping and the expectations that are assigned around traditional gender norms. Uh, the primary tasks of emotional labor are all coded as feminine. They're all coded as sort of motherly and nurturing, right? Uh, so what does that mean for us? Um, doing what's expected. Uh, 2005 study, uh, women who stayed at work late and offered to help a coworker were ranked 14% less favorably than a man doing the same thing. But if the woman declined to do it, she was rated 12% lower than a man who also declined. What does that actually mean? It, it basically indicates a 26 point swing in perceived collegiality between men and women based on are they willing to go the extra mile to help someone else, right? Well, what the heck does that mean? What does that imply? Um, here's a big long quote. Um, this one, I like this one. This is for Jenna. The Public Administration Review. This was a government analysis of people in administrative positions um, in the federal government. Yeah, task required emotive work uh, thought natural for women. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, such as caring, negotiating, empathizing, smoothing troubled relationships, and working behind the scenes to enable cooperation are required components of many women's jobs. Excluded from job descriptions and performance elevation, uh, evaluations, the work is invisible and uncompensated. Okay. <laughs> think about think about who sets up those special birthday parties in your office. Right? Now, if it's the HR director, that's probably part of their job. But if it's always the same people volunteering, why are they volunteering to do that? It, it was fascinating. I'll give you a fascinating example. Um, uh, the very nice organizers, uh, April, one of the organizers, gave me a handwritten note yesterday thanking me for coming and giving a talk. And I said, hey, I really appreciate the thought that went into it, but I really don't need this. You know, like, thank you, but you didn't have to put forth that effort. But here she's putting forth, and the organizers are all putting forth a little bit of effort to make us all feel comfortable and welcome. And, you know, going out of their way to thank us for stuff. Hey, I'm not moved by that. But that's because I'm a jerk, right? Um, uh, so some people don't need, think they don't need that kind of support or nurturing. Like, I really don't care if we ever have office birthday parties. I don't, I don't care. I like to keep a little bit of work-life distance. So like, I never know how many kids my colleagues have because I can't remember because I don't care that much. It's true. And I, I've told them. Like, I kind of care, but I kind of don't. Right? Because um, <clears throat> i got enough stuff going on in my own. Um, my point is, a lot of people, the cultural norms suggest that um, for women in particular, or people who identify as women, or excuse me, people who are identified by others as women, um, <clears throat> this kind of caring is, is expected, right? Oh, of course Susan will stay late to do X, right? But you wouldn't expect John to do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> how does this apply to Drupal? There's a hierarchy of contributions. I sold this and some other stuff from Preston Center, Preston's a genius, I love him. Um, code is the, the, the highest level of our pyramid. We really respect code, documentation, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then event organizing, teaching, writing, um, diversity and inclusion stuff is all down at the bottom. Guess where the emotional labor stuff is? It's all down here, right? The coders, in fact, try to take emotion out as much as they possibly can, right? That's where a lot of conflict comes in. Because they're like, oh, it's not important. We just care about the code. We've had people kicked out of the community because they think that people's feelings aren't important, and they only care about the code. Uh, that's always an interesting case. So this is the problem. The primary tasks of emotional labor are not valued equally with, quote unquote, real work. Okay, <clears throat> informal duty. So this is, again, a problem. The time women spend on these necessary but unrecognized chores, taxes, and energy undermines their workplace authority, and reduces the time they could be spending a more socially, professionally recognized and valued work. So it is one of the things that explains, or tries to explain, um, why there's a gender gap in promotion and in salary. 
because we're asking women to take on extra duties that are not really part of their job. Right? Again, this may seem like a tangent, but I think it actually applies in an open source community. A um, couple of things. Yeah, this is that natural thing. The natural, if it's natural to do certain things, then all women are expected to do them and even like doing them. Right? This is pernicious, and this is a pervasive attitude. It's also true of men. There are things that like, oh yeah, men are supposed to like doing outdoorsy things and killing spiders and taking out the garbage. I've been married almost 20 years. My wife has never taken out the garbage, and that's okay. That's a little pack we have. And I, whenever we're in her car together, she's not allowed to pump gas. I don't let her pump her own gas, because men, <laughs> right? <clears throat> that doesn't mean that all men should be expected to pump gas at all times. Right. Um, but this is particularly uh, attached to women. Um, <clears throat> the reason I bring this up in the context of Drupal is that I think it helps explain why 6% of contributors on this survey identified as female. Because I think we are unwittingly pushing them away. <laughs> because we expect them to do certain things. Right. So this is similar to the trolling. Requiring emotional labor from someone in order to join a group is a form of exclusion. We talked about inclusion earlier. So if you have to conform to certain norms in order to get into the group, right? Drupal is fascinating in this respect, respect too, because it started off as a small band of people, a very small band of people. Um, and it has grown very exponentially over the last 10 years. Um, and standards have changed. Uh, behaviors have changed when you get out of that group. So we are going to, well, we got 20 minutes. We'll be okay on What are the effects on open source communities? Um, again, more sort of problems. Uh, this is true of all software projects. Uh, team positive emotional display decreases with project duration. Yeah. Yeah, Jenna's like, yep, yeah, uh-huh. I, I hit a nerve there. How many of you have ever worked on a, on a single project that lasted longer than 12 months? How do you feel at the end of, say, month 16 compared to month 2? In fact, I, I can say this, I think I said this in the last one. We lost a contract with Jenna's employer because we refused to guarantee she would, they would have the same team from us for longer than a year. And there's a two-year project. Like, no, we're going to rotate people in and out. Why? Boom. And they said, no, we got to have the same people. Or like, I, we can't guarantee that. Because we can't guarantee the psychological safety uh, of our team for that long. Which is our problem, not their problem. Let me be clear. I said that with your boss in the room, too, in Seattle. <coughs> and he was not. He was like, oh, I get it. Um, <laughs> it gets worse. Open source software teams tend to use technology, media, communication, limiting interaction quality. So number one, our emotional state sort of degrades over time. And number two, the tools we use and the way we, we interact are less than ideal, right? Um, we do like to get together to solve problems. When we come together for common reasons, um, that's great. We have a place like Drupal Camp Astro, that's awesome. <laughs> the problem that we run into is we don't always have the same values, attitudes, or even language. And this is where I have fun with people in the room like Joanna who is not from America, yeah. Jordana, excuse me. I almost got your name. Right. I'm so good with names. <laughs> um, human emotions, uh, joy, sadness, anger, elation, jealousy, envy, despair, are in large part socially defined. Um, I think this is kind of fascinating. Um, and emotional standards are cultural. Uh, each culture provides us with prototypes of feeling which like different keys on a piano. This is a great quote. Um, attune us to different inner notes. So this is fascinating. Um, the last time I saw what I would consider a, a, a sexist behavior code of conduct violation, it was a young man from West Africa talking to a woman from Canada at the diversity and inclusion booth. He didn't know he was doing anything wrong. He thought he was just being friendly and complimentary, and he was being a little creepy. It was fascinating because we're at the diversity and inclusion booth, and like six of us are there, and none of it. I, mean, I literally tried to cut him off three times, and he just wouldn't have it. He kept being, no, no, I'd like to talk to the pretty girl. Like, uh. And finally, she engaged with him. And 
and I ran into him the next day and I'm like, okay, so let me explain what's going on in North America right now and why that was inappropriate. <clears throat> right? We didn't publicly shame him, but it's fascinating because he, he was not doing anything actually sexual. He just thought he was being friendly and complimentary. And no one really knew how to handle it. It was bizarre. Uh, that happens a lot, I think. So <clears throat> this is my example of why um, emotions are cultural. So schadenfreude is a German word. How many people recognize this word? I love this word. Um, litosch. Litosch is a Czech word. How many people recognize this word? I do, because I wrote this. <laughs> schadenfreude is great. A uh, pleasure derived by the, someone from another person's misfortune. You know, I trip and spill water all over myself and you laugh. Right. Um, we actually use this word in English. It's in the English dictionary. Um, that's why 75% of you know it. Uh, Latosh is a state of agony and torment created to some side of one's own misery. It's a um, <laughs> phrase, uh, a word popularized by Milan Kundera, apparently. Um, we do not have this word in English. We don't use it. The closest word we have to this actually is ennui, which is a French word that we've stolen. Right? So, this is an emotional context for Czech people that we don't even recognize. Okay? Now, you have to sort of extrapolate from that. Right? And so perhaps this young man from West Africa is trained such that his appropriate emotional response or his appropriate social response when meeting new people is to give them a compliment. And perhaps that's the best compliment he can think to give. And that was, in fact, what he was thinking. So, culture guides the act of recognizing a feeling by proposing what's possible for us to feel. Yeah. Um, and so, the, one of the problems of distributed teams, made worse because we're mostly volunteers, uh, misunderstandings based on cultural, social, and language issues are often made worse. Uh, you notice on Drupal.org now, you can, you can put in your profile where you're from and what languages you speak natively, and they will put that in the issue queue, right, next to your name which can be very, very helpful. I'm pretty sure I had a Chinese person come in and post an issue in my queue. Pretty sure they don't speak English as native language. I had no idea what they were trying to tell me. And so I had to be extra polite in saying, can you please put this as a bulleted list of things because I really can't follow what you're trying to tell me. I, I doubt I would get any response from that. Um, <clears throat> so community work is emotional. Um, and critically important. So th this long distance communication, the fact that we have multiple cultures that don't all share the same standard. Also notice a lot of the diversity and inclusion, inclusion and code of conduct discussions and arguments we have. There's a big disparity between North America and Europe. I had a great conversation with the German who's like, why would I agree to moderate my behavior in advance before I've actually offended anyone? I, I refuse to do that. But, okay. Like if, if I offend someone, they should tell me, and then we can we can work it out. It's like, what if they don't feel comfortable telling me? Yeah. So there's a different cultural sensitivity. Uh, generally, I would say that's because most European cultures are uh, more monoculture than diverse. You go to Denmark, for instance, and 98% of people are Danish. 95% of people are Danish. They brought up with specific cultural norms and expectations. They all know what they are, right? But I also would point out that. I use this as an example. I was once advised by a Dutch member of the community not to go to a Dutch football game because there were expected modes of behavior that I would not know and I might accidentally get beaten up for like wearing the wrong color shirt. So there's a code of conduct, it's just unwritten is my sort of argument. One of my ha hobbies now is actually um, gathering codes of conduct every time I go somewhere. Like I was on a ferry in rural Scotland and they had a code of conduct. Like, really? It's a ferry that like a thousand people use a year. You have a code of conduct that basically says, it basically says like, don't get drunk and abuse people. Like, don't swear at the staff, or we'll throw you off the boat. <laughs> um, so, my point is, governance, conduct, you know, dispute resolution. These are these are the biggest sort of challenges. Uh, my argument is, without the glue of emotional labor, uh, communities all fall apart. Right? If no one's doing that. So, yeah, what the heck do we do about it? Um, again, stealing from Preston. Um, assume everything is possible. Don't make assumptions based on how one person represents themselves. Right? So this is about not assuming that 
oh, they look like they're interested in X. So just ask them, hey, what are you interested in doing? Um, <clears throat> we need to be intentional. I, I do like this language. This is from Press Office. Um, intentionality involves living and acting according to your own or a group's values and principles rather than surrounding or prevailing ones. Uh, it requires one to be aware of fundamental beliefs and willing to make an effort to have their behavior reflect these beliefs. By the way, it requires possibly some surface acting and some other things. It causes you to moderate your behavior when you're in the Drupal space. Like, for instance, I'm not going to curse publicly, or try not to, in a Drupal space. I don't think it's appropriate because we're in a semi professional environment. But this idea of intentionality, being aware of how you're interacting with other people, I think is critically important. Um, and then recognizing uh, contributors. Then we're doing really well at this recently. Code is still most highly valued. Uh, we still make assumptions. Uh, we do often place barriers in front of new uh, contributors. So we need to lessen that. Um, we actually can do this now. Um, there are now people who can create issues and you get issue credit, which is sort of community karma for event organizing and mentoring and all those kinds of things. So I think this, we're making decent progress on this. Um, but we do need to make sure we recognize that. Didn't Kevin win a, uh, an award last, mm -hmm. was it last year for his work? Just going around and recording stuff? That's good. And, and I, I had listening to this. Um, the, all, almost all the emotional labor I do at work now is just listening to people and then trying to give them feedback based on what I heard. Um, this is the other piece. In, invite people in. Um, you're, everyone is an ambassador. We need to make sure that our spaces are safe, welcoming, and inclusive. Um, you know, reach out to new groups, new contributors. This is my yellow hat theory. Right? Somebody should be in charge. Because there are a few things, for me, and I assume many of you feel the same, a few things worse than walking into a room with 20 strangers and trying to figure out how you're going to interact with them. Right? But you ever have that, that experience where you walk into a, like a Drupal camp or a big space and it's like, oh wait, there's Mike. And you go straight to Mike. <laughs> right? Thank God there's Mike. Yay. And you instantly relax, because at least you know one person. And it's interesting because I do board game stuff now in my spare time. And I was at Origins. Origins is 30,000 people. And I know like a dozen. Right? And, and, but when, and they're, most of them were working. And so I go like bug them at their booth for five minutes and then wander off. I find something else to do. Um, but it was necessary. <clears throat> Get that little recharge just to play. Hey, there's a friendly face who knows my name that I don't have to put forth effort to introduce myself to, right? Um, I also sort of warn this, be aware of bad actors. Um, I think there's some discussion we can have around this. I got some pushback on this from, from some core maintainers, but I still agree with it. People who create more emotional labor than they provide are toxic and may cause permanent harm, right? You ever have the person in your life who loves drama and just thrives on stirring things up this is what I'm talking about. And we've had these people in the community before too. They just, they get bored easily. They, they just, they just want to nudge people. We were, we were at a hockey game at DrupalCon Boston. And hockey games are pretty rough places. You can get away with a lot. But I did, you know, everyone remember George Carlin's The Seven Dirty Words You Can't Say on TV? It's an old routine I've shown my age. Seven words you can't say on TV. I can't say them because I said I wouldn't. They're all curse words. And I, I just mentioned this person who was not from the US. Hey, these are the seven things. You can shout anything you want except these seven things. And in the middle of the third quarter, he stood up and yelled at the top of his lungs, hit someone you effing see. And the entire section turned. And they immediately yanked him down into his seat. And the security guard came up and was like, who said that? He couldn't figure out who it was. And he did it, just, it, it turned out, I mean, I, I realized later, this person does things like this all the time, just to get a rise out of people around him, particularly me in this case. After I explicitly told him not to do that, after I had just gotten <laughs> an emergency phone call because my father-in-law had been checked into the hospital with heart palpitations, and we were afraid he had a heart attack. So, screw that. Guy. 
<laughs> That's toxic behavior, right? Didn't recognize it at the time, but yeah. Is, is that always intentional? Is that always intentional? That is the that fascinating. So but. here's the funny thing about intention, and I love this slide for this question. I used to have a different image here. The image that I had here in the last version was actually the Bad Camp logo, and I didn't realize it. Now, the Bad Camp logo is a grinning, leering pirate. Maybe not the best image. That's, and, and one of the organizers of Bad Camp complained that someone took a picture of it and posted it on Twitter. And it's like, are you suggesting that Bad Camp is toxic? I was like, oh, uh, I did not mean to imply that. So my intention is actually irrelevant. Right? The, the, the intentional fallacy. Oh, what did the person think? Doesn't matter. Right? Did not matter that I did not intend to offend the, the bad camp people. I potentially could have. And it cost me nothing to say, I'm sorry, that was not my intention. Let me fix that. So when digging into that question of intention, um, this is something that the, the uh, community working group does a lot when they do mediation. You can have that conversation with people and say, hey, you know this, is, this slide you have is potentially offensive. And if they immediately get defensive and say, like, well, maybe you shouldn't have a grinning pirate logo that looks like it's leering at people off camera, maybe they're not interested in being conciliatory and community-oriented. Right? And that's what tends to get people in trouble. When you, you sort of bring up like, oh, hey, you said this thing, and potentially it bothered me a little bit. And the immediate response is to get defensive and attack. That's not good. So in, intention is this really funny space. Um, and I think it's important to be able to say, and I've had to practice this too, oh, that's interesting. I didn't consider that as an option. I was doing a slide presentation once, and I wanted to use pictures of different members of our staff who identify uh, differently than I do. And I, uh, at my boss's urging, he said, hey, you should reach out to these people and tell them that you'd like to use their photos. And one of them said, oh no, hell no. And I said, okay, can, are you willing to take the time to explain to me why? And thankfully they did. And I learned a ton. Uh, so. Yeah, I think for me, I've been working on it from the other side of it, separating intention from impact. Mm -hmm. The way that you did something impacted me, and it was over the top, and I'm just off the rails about it. But your intent was very unlikely to have been to do that. And so taking, yes, this is how it makes me feel, but that might not have been the intent. And moderating mm -hmm. that separation between those two is something that I've been working on recently. And it's tricky because some people have difficulty processing that issue. We have someone who got kicked out of the community basically because he was incapable of seeing how his behavior affected other people. That's a tricky one. Um, it's taken some time to come back a little bit say, hey, I think I understand now. Can I participate again? And this is a fascinating problem. But essentially, you know, the people in question have to show some willingness to listen, uh, to understand. It's, it's really important when you're caught in this situation to be able to actually say back to someone, oh, yeah, I do understand why you think that bad camp photo might be interpreted that way. Yes, I get it. Let me not do that. Right? But sometimes people are incapable of making that, that sort of leap. And so a lot of, again, the work that the community working group ends up having to do is that kind of mediation with people. So we don't want to throw people out. We want to keep them included, right? Uh, especially, again, if you have difficulty processing emotion or empathy and therefore communicating with people in a non-aggressive way, we might still like you to be around if we can help you interact with people in a productive way. And that's, that's that really interesting area. The, the reason I bring this stuff up is I think it's important for us to be aware of it, right? And the fact that you're aware of it is, is critical. I mean, I've given this talk, this is the fourth time I've given it, uh, two Drupal cons here and internally to a group of our project managers and our HR director. Because our project managers are tasked with, among other things, the psychological safety of team members. Right? And so they're asked to do a lot of emotional thinking. 
and I want them to be able to identify it and actually spread it around too. Because one of the biggest things when you're in that position where you're having to do a lot of that caregiving um, is making sure you're getting some back, right? The, the spoons analogy, like I only have so many spoons. Well, how are you refilling those spoons, right? Did you see the bagel boss thing <clears throat> that happened this week? No. There was a video that went viral, some guy going on a tear in a bagel boss store and it, verbally assaulting women about how they don't always swipe right on Tinder or whatever because he's short and just like crazy, just ranting. But it turned out this is a thing this guy does. There's a whole YouTube of him like publicly shaming or verbally going after people, and it's his it's like his videos that he's posting mm -hmm. of his outrage or whatever, going after people, calling them names and, and stuff. So there was this conflict of like this video blew up, but it turns out that guy was a bad actor, right. not just a guy who had a bad day getting put in a bad situation, but yeah. this is a thing he does all the time. It's really fascinating. I think the thing about this is. It's easy to see spot, and spot these people that are intentionally bad actors. The scary thing is the, the people that aren't intending to hurt, but they do, right? So this is why he said the CDMG tries to explain impact more than anything, because when somebody tells you something was something I did was hurtful, it doesn't, it, like he said, it doesn't really matter. It's good that your intention was not to hurt me, but you still hurt me, right? So right. how do you? So that's what, what he was talking about. Like the intention, it, it's nice and all, but it still doesn't change the fact that you're being hurtful. Yeah. So that, that's where, where most of it is explaining impact. That, that is essentially why I was asked not to use someone's photo. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, you're centering yourself by marking me as different. Because <coughs> mm. so I was trying to make the point in a talk that uh, I'm coming from a very specific perspective as a uh, cisgendered heterosexual man. And so I had someone who's like, yeah, who's not one of those, you know, any of those things on my team say, yeah, don't use me as an example. You don't need me. No. Don't bring me into that. Find another way to get to what you're at. Then um, we had a very, very productive conversation, um, which is great. Um, I should say we're at time. I have like two official slides left. I don't think it matters. I'm more than happy to stay and have whatever conversation we need to. Um, other things I recommend. This is actually critically important. To set milestones and celebrate them, right? Um, set personal and community goals. Work together to be accountable to them. And then take turns of sort of share, sharing burdens and, and celebrating joys, right? One of the easiest things, literally one of the easiest things that men can do is like, hey, I'll, I'll take notes at this meeting, or, hey, I'll clean up after this meeting is over. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a good one, right? Um, we're all equally responsible for the health of our community. Oh, yeah, so, again, the, the thing I want to say is, you see what I said at the beginning, it's like, there's a reason I do this talk. Um, as a 50-year-old American white dude who's been in the community for 14 years, because almost any criticism that comes out of some of the stuff that I talk about is going to bounce off. You're um, not risking wait. your job, right? <clears throat> Sorry? You're not risking your job. I don't believe that I'm risking my job, no. I don't believe that I'm risking my reputation or stance in the community. I believe I am um, saying things that are important to discuss that would be more difficult for other people, A, to say publicly, and B, to get taken seriously to a fascinating problem in itself. Uh, we had this really fascinating conversation at work. I'm the senior director of consulting now because I can literally walk into most client rooms and be taken seriously immediately. <laughs> Where we have other members of the teams who are not. And I might be saying almost the exact same thing. So I practice doing this kind of thing in, in meetings. Hey, that's a great point. Jordana, can you explain more? Right? Share the authority for that. Let me defer to the person who you really should be respecting in this situation. Right. <clears throat> but and, and it's interesting to me also, when you look at sort of diversity and inclusion thing, which I think this is part of, you do typically have the same people making, being asked to do those talks all the time. And so spreading that around, I think, is, is pretty critical. So, thank you for your time and attention. Like I said, if you have questions or if you want to discuss any of this stuff, I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, so.
I'm going to turn off the recording.